So thank you very much for inviting me here. It's beautiful out today. Um, my name is Sean Kent, and I'm going to do a modified owl secret life of backyard and migratory birds, kind of focused a little bit on DW Fields and the area here. Um, I'll, I've got the presentation also on my iPad, so I'm going to show a lot of pictures. And uh, I'm not going to play some of the videos that I had set in because it'll just be too hard to, to see and observe there. But right now we're entering kind of peak fall migration time over the next month and i'm going to talk a little bit about that and i'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, the owls that'll be living in the dw fields brockton area that that are that are probably quite numerous uh, in the area especially with the habitat uh, the way that it is and i'll do the best that i can with it with the system and we'll see how long the battery life lasts but one thing that I want to just start out with, and I really don't know how visible these are, but, and <laughs> you can see here, these are hummingbirds that I took pictures of oh, last yeah. fall in just my yard in downtown Mansfield. Oh. And they come yeah. every day, yeah, every day to my yard without feeders because of the native plants oh. that yeah, are planted plant there. Are? That's ironweed, New York ironweed, ironweed. yeah. yeah. Yeah, and you can see it on the screen there as well too. And they're starting to fuel up in Massachusetts right now, and we'll be starting their migration um, back to um, Central and South America uh, through there. And I'm going to talk about those type of birds there too. And then to kind of switch gears a little bit, I'm just going to start off with a lot of different pictures here, is another bird that's going to be really common in this area. And these are pictures that I took in the springtime. So you're going to have great blue herons here oh, we have as well, now. see a lot. Yes. Yeah. But what they're doing, and you can see it here, this is the picture that I took in Norden in the spring at the Norden Reservoir, right here, is they spend a lot of their time just sitting and waiting. And if you see them around here, just along the edges of the ponds, what they're doing here is they're fishing. And if you look closely, you'll see a pretty large calico bass in its mouth right there. Okay. And, and you can see how large, they just swallow the fish hole yeah. right through there. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and, yeah. <laughs> and they'll swallow two, three, four pound. Yep. You can see the picture where it's going down. So you can see the whole fish is still alive on its way down right through there. No teeth and they're going to just be digested through that way. And then you can see right here uh, when it's flying away. But these will spend the whole spring, summer, and fall at D... Well, not the spring so much, but the summer and fall at DW Fields. I don't think there's any rookeries here, are there, where there's lots of old trees that have died and they have their nests in the top? There's a rookie, rookery over in Rentham at Walla Walla Pog. Uh, I don't know if it's a state park, but that's the, the, that's the reservation. It's right on 495. Great horned owls will be there earlier in the spring nesting as well, too. Um, throughout that. So I just wanted to highlight the great blue herons here and because they're going to be relatively present, they're going to be present here uh, all all winter, and they're you have birds like the hummingbirds, okay. In this picture, right back, right here, these have to migrate, okay. So they're obligate migratory species; they have to fly south, okay. Otherwise, they're not going to survive the winter. And I'm not talking like the random one here or there that might be able to make it. I don't think a hummingbird would be able to make it. With the great blue herons, however, they're facultative migratory birds. They're only going to migrate as far as they have to and depending on the winter. So you might have a, a, a milder winter and have uh, great blue herons that are, ne that are not nesting, but that are here all winter. If you go down to the Cape in the wintertime, you're actually going to see a lot more of them in the winter in the salt marshes because they never freeze and there's enough food. So these may only end up migrating down to Connecticut or New Jersey, Long Island, those areas depending on the winter. But they can also get caught, too. Whereas if there's a quick cold snap and they can actually freeze or basically die die here because they the, the, they hedge their bets. Um, whereas in like they're going to try and see if they can make it without using all the energy that they might use for migration right through there. And then also at the end, I don't ha I only have one part on ducks. I can also talk about the ducks that are here too because I just saw a duck fly in closely um, with that. But I just want to kind of show some pictures. And all these pictures that I took in Easton and in Canton last year, uh, excuse me, this spring during migration over just two days in May. And then I'll talk about the migration there uh, later on. 
but you'll have this beautiful bird at DW Fields for a couple of weeks coming through. And this is a black and white warbler. And I took this in a parking lot in Easton. It was right next to my car. And this moves up and down the trees like a nuthatch. So either a red-breasted nuthatch or a white-breasted nuthatch right through there. And these birds come through in high, high numbers, along with many other warblers in the springtime, and then now migrating in the fall. And they'll be in the woods here along the parking lot, running basically up and down the trees for two, three weeks, depending on what, what time period in May that they're actually migrating through. And another species I'll talk about, depending on time and how this works out, is your earliest migratory bird that comes back here. And they must be all over DW fields, right, with the, uh, yep. the red-winged blackbirds. And then the males here are going to come back. This was taken at Stony Brook this spring. The males are going to come back about a three weeks to a month earlier than the female red-winged blackbirds. And they're going to nest in, like, the reeds that you can see over there in that area, and then kind of in wetland shrubs and trees. So there's not a lot of nesting spots right here for them, but they, they, they're very good at finding um, lots of places to nest. They'll nest in like kind of wet meadows and fields through there. And I wanted to bring up this bird along with the tree swallow. This is a barn swallow right here. And these definitely, I don't see many nesting boxes here. And then here's a closer up picture of it. The tree swallows will use nesting boxes along with bluebirds. But this barn swallow with the water and the open fields, this is definitely a bird you should have or could have, depending on kind of the other kind of environmental resources that it has. But all summer, you would have, I would expect there'd be barn swallows and tree swallows flying over the water, picking off like aquatic uh, uh, flies that are in dragonflies and stuff that are flying around. Like when you somebody you brought up the, the golf course, yeah, because they'll they'll nest. Tree swallows need old uh, tree cavities that woodpeckers may have made on on dying or dead trees. Barn swallows. If you look at like the ridge line over on the maintenance building right there, especially underneath the light. They may make a mud, basically mud and spit. They'll make a cup nest that'll go underneath there. But on the sides of the building, inside the maintenance shed, if there were open doors in the golf course, uh, they would nest in the tower, for example, um, in those openings. That's why they're called barn swallows, because they would fly into barns and nest in there, and they'll have, they'll have small colonies right through there as well, too. And the other bird that I was just talking about, this is, the blue, this is an eastern bluebird. This is a pair that we had at the Museum of American Bird Art this spring and summer nesting. That's the male on the top and then the female on the bottom right there. And these you could also either have or, or, or could have at DW Fields. And here they are flying into and out of the nest box. That's the female flying into that's the fl female flying into the nest box with a, a, um, a beetle in its mouth. And they actually fledged between five and ten baby bluebirds this year over two. They, they actually nested twice in the museum here. And then here's the male. Whoops. Here's the male. And if you see it flying away, think of five baby birds in one nest. They're going to have a lot of poop and waste. That's the male actually flying the poop out in its mouth, not an insect. They clean it themselves until the very end, and they let everything. Get, then everything gets kind of goes goes away because they leave the nest. And, Oh, oh, with the box. You just throw the old nest on the ground. Yeah. I mean, you can leave it in there, but um, disease and stuff will build up. But it, it, it's pretty easy to... Let it drop, slide it back in. Yeah, you just, you just, you just, you just take it right out. Because they're going to make nests... Bluebirds are going to make nests using uh, grass and other, uh, other types of materials. Tree swallows are a little bit less fastidious, so they just make it kind of a soft um, bottom of the nest. And then they basically steal a couple of feathers from either ducks geese, hawks, usually hawks. They'll have a couple of feathers, either ones that they, uh, that they use for insulation on the nest there as well, too. Yeah. And then these are all birds that are going to be migrating back. And a few other birds, and I'll talk about migration a little bit more in depth in a little while, but I just want to talk about like birds that are you'll have at DW Fields, too, and that you can see that'll nest here. Here's a Baltimore Oriole, and they'll nest right over the water. And they've got a really elaborate song. I, I, I have the songs on the computer, but I just don't know how well they're going to play with all the noise and the wind. 
So you can see, and you can see this was right during migration with the oak leaves just coming out. And you can see one thing that it's doing right here is they almost exclusively eat insects because they need that type of protein. So what it's doing right there is it's going into the oak catkin. That's where the oak pollen is. And it's looking for caterpillars and other insects that I'll show you later on that they're eating right there that you can see there. But they'll nest in these trees right here. They, they weave these basket nests um, all with their beaks and then they tie everything together with their, their, their claws, their toes. But like those oaks right over there, I wouldn't be surprised if you're walking around here in November. If you look, you'll see one basket nest hanging out of there. Did anybody see or hear any Orioles this summer? I know it's there, but like you never find them there. Yeah. That's the amazing thing. So if you see them when the when the, see the leaves when they're out in this picture right here, where you can see through the leaves, that's the you can obviously find the nest if you if you keep seeing where they're going. This is the only time you'll be able to see it because once the oak leaves or other tree leaves fill in, it basically disappears and becomes part of the tree because it even moves and and weighs with it. But it'll be like a half foot down, and then you know five baby birds will be right in the bottom of that with the five eggs, and it's going to be no bigger than like the honeydew cup right there, if so right through there. And this right here, and I'll show a more detailed picture of this later on, this is a Nashville warbler coming through this spring as well, and I'm going to show the chickadees. But those crab apples, oh, and <laughs> those crab apple trees and the cherry trees with all the blossoms, is these are really important because they're, this Nashville warbler, and I'll show you how it does it because I have a whole series of pictures later on, is is going for the caterpillars that are eat that are eating the flowers and eating the new leaves that are coming out before the tree can actually produce a lot of the defensive chemicals in there. So that's the chickadee right here, and it's actually got a caterpillar in its beak right through here. And then here's another bird that you'll be able to see in the springtime and the fall. This is a yellow-rumped warbler. Again, same thing, cherry, crab apples, quince. All those early flowering trees are really, really important, and I know you must have a lot of them. Uh, around here too, throughout there. So that's like kind of just, those are just some photos that I took of bird migration uh, this springtime that I kind of wanted over just basically one, one to two weeks in May. And we'll talk a little bit about like the migration that's happening right now and it's gonna happen later on in the month uh, in a little while. But I did also wanna talk about the owls that are gonna be around here uh, all year. And then there's another species that I won't talk about, the sawwood owl, they'll be here during the su spring, summer and fall. But this is really fantastic habitat, being urban within a park for a lot of the owl species. Great horned owls are going to be here, barred owls are going to be here, and screech owls are going to be here all year long and nesting too as well. So the owls all around is, in, I don't know how well you can see it, but this, and I'll, I'll bring it closer as we move along, but this is the barred owl right here in this picture. And that you can see here, this is a picture that I took. Okay, and these are all pictures that mostly I took at the museum. There's a few great horn owl pictures that somebody else took, but you can see the barred owl right there, Beautiful. right there. I took, I think I took this one this year, but we, I know where they roost. You can see the oh, barred owl so there. Cool. That's a barred owl from the museum. It's at the Museum of American Bird Art, just down the street in Canton. Oh, I'd be more than happy for you to come. Yeah, and this is where it roosts. So this is why you don't normally see owls. Normally, I, I ask people to look find the owl in the picture, but I'll just bring it around, and you can try and find it. <laughs> but, it's, it's, but it works when it's dark and in an auditorium. Yeah. Not so well here. <laughs> but this, this owl took me 10 minutes to find. And the reason, it took, the reason I was able to find it was because of blue jays and crows attack, kind of mobbing and making a huge ruckus of the scene because these owls are predators. So that's a screech owl. It's about the size of my microphone, maybe a little bit smaller. And so there's probably one looking at us right now here. Because if it closes its eyes, you can't see it. So you can see it. Yeah, you can see it on the big screen there as well. And then here's the picture with the zoomed in one, uh, the, the picture that I showed you, and then the picture of the owl zoomed in. Oh, wow. Oh, it is not too big. Yeah. Oh, wow. And I have a few more pictures of this, but it just, I have a few more pictures of owls like hiding, or not hiding, because they're not hiding. They're, they're just that well camouflaged, so I guess it's hiding in a different respect. That'll just be, I think, a little too hard to see, but I'll kind of show you on the screen. But you'll walk by them, and 
they'll just almost never move and just kind of sit there, especially during the daytime, because they're not necessarily like sleeping during the day. They're just kind of like kind of resting and hanging out through there. Because it here, I'm just going to circle it to show you, because usually I ask people if they can find it. Here's a great horned owl picture that I took this spring at the Museum of American Bird Art. But that's the, that's, that's the owl, and I'll show you a better picture of it right there. And the only reason I saw, the only reason I happened to catch a movement out of my eye and it landed, and I went to look for it right there, but that, that's a great horned owl in the circle. And it just blends right in with the trees right there. So it could, like I said, it, depending on the angle and the tall pines right through there, it could, like, especially that, see that huge one across 12 o'clock to me? There could be just one sitting up there, or a barred owl, and if it's, if it's sitting on the right part of the tree, it, even if it's not the exact color, yeah, and it, it's the pattern that breaks it up. This is from a different day. I had another picture of the owl at a different angle with its eyes. It's just so hard to see in the light right here. They're pretty active at night. That's primarily when they're active, but that doesn't mean they won't be active or flying around during the day, but they're mostly resting during the day. I could never find this owl's nest, but they were, they were there all summer with two of them. I didn't see any babies either, but I'm almost positive that they had to be nesting right through there. And then this is another day, and this is why I want to just bring this up, and it's just too loud to hear, but the only reason I found this owl was during a rainy, it was like March 10th this year, and it was a rainy day. And if you see that shadow through the trees to the right of it, that's a crow. And that's a crow chasing and harassing this owl, making a lot of noise. So if you hear really angry crows right through there, there was actually six crows around this owl. But the only one that I photographed was that one in the picture, which is right there. And that's a blue jay making a, an alarm call over there or a territorial call. So if you start listening for blue jays, like that's probably nothing, but if it keeps going and going and getting more and more birds involved and you might hear chickadees and then you might hear like chipmunks or squirrels making those noises then there's probably like something going on so you can use those clues and just kind of st stand or sit and wait and look around and maybe it'll be nothing or maybe uh, maybe you'll hear it the great horned owl and barred owl actually were very close in the wildlife sanctuary in Kansas and at the Museum of American Bird Art and they kind of partition the site into two different areas, which is very unusual, because usually the great horned owl will drive off the barred owl or eat it, or just kill it, because they don't want to share the resources there. But primarily, the barred owls took the center of the sanctuary, and the great horns took the left side of the sanctuary. And I saw them within 100 feet of each other on multiple times, which is very, very unusual. The barred owls also would roost in an area that had lots of dead, very close together pine trees. There was living ones in there too. And my hypothesis uh, or idea of why that was happening was because the great horn couldn't come in quick and catch it unaware and basically slam into it and kill it. So the barred owl would be tucked into this one small area and always kind of on alert for that as well too. I don't know if that's true, but that was kind of my working hypothesis there. And so usually there's a lot more gap. So you wouldn't rarely see a, a red-tailed hawk nest near a great horned owl. Plus they wouldn't anyway because the great horns are nesting February, March, and April typically. And red-tailed hawks are be nesting uh, after that. Um, I, I, off the top of my head, I don't know if it's going to be like April, May, June, or, or what it is with the red tails. But they're going to be nesting at later time periods. They also, great horned owls are going to nest in heron rookeries. And they eat plenty of herons too, believe it or not. But they're nesting January, February, March, like that area. And then the herons come in April, May and nest there as well. So there's not that overlap, too. But a great horned owl would try and run off a red-tailed hawk. I mean, a red-tailed hawk could, could, could kind of hold its own, but same thing. Well, none of them are very friendly. No, no. Even the little birds aren't friendly. Like, the, like the, the house wren tries to run off and kill the bluebirds at our nesting boxes, too. Yeah. And then here's a picture of a barn owl. They're going to be in Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard in Massachusetts. But if you see the two X's, this is the best way that I can think of doing it right there on the face. And see how it's kind of got that heart-shaped, cone-shaped face right there? So our, our ears are parallel, okay? You know, they're at the same level on either side of our fa face, so here and here. With an owl, it, this one's going to be up a little higher, one's going to be up a little lower. So the sound coming in from the left side and the right side is going to get to each ear at a different time. So they're able to do the calculus and calculate where that sound is coming from and the distance and the location from it there. 
think of that if you have like leaves and voles rustling or squirrels rustling around and the owl is sitting in the tree, it can calculate the direction with its eyes closed and where that animal is. And then as it flies in and is listening, it will keep calculating and then can pick it right out of the sky. Because those, and the male's gonna look right at the camera here. Again, it's really hard to see with this, this setup. Um, you know, the barn owl can hunt in complete darkness because they did experiments in a gym in the 50s where they just let mice loose in the gym underneath, I think, leaves. I think they filled the gym with leaves, and the barn owls were in there and could hunt and pick them out just like that. And so that they're able to, and they're able to move the feathers so they can direct sound into those cones into their ears to tell the difference right through there. And that's why I put the two X's right there on the barn owl's face because you can see with the heart-shaped disc, and you can see it a little bit with the great horned owl, that they're able to use sound as the primary means of hunting uh, in that case. And then their feathers are st st structured in such a way where they've got fringe on it. So they basically can fly silently with no, with absolutely no sound waves. They show the sound waves underneath this. It's really wonderful. I can send you the, the link to the video. It's from the BBC. And even if you f they fly over feathers in the back, last part of the video, the pigeon throws up all this turbulent flow with the feathers flying all over the place. The peregrine throws up all this turbulent flow, and the feathers don't even move when that barn owl flies over it. And they're actually much bigger than their body size. Uh, like, you know, the wings are much bigger than their body size right, right there. Uh, these videos aren't going to show up very well, so I'll skip them right here. But again, here's the second owl that you can see that's in the sanctuary, that'll be in, at DW Fields. This is the barred owl. This is the second biggest owl right here. Right through there. Uh, two R's, yeah, like bars, yep. And barn is barn because that's where they live and they do it well there. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, but it always pays attention when you hear blue jays like that, you know, if you're walking by to just kind of like look around. But this is the second owl that I'd be, I'd be really surprised if, it, if there wasn't a presence um, for this animal here. And then here's a picture of it. I love this picture. I got this one. This is one of the best pictures I've taken in the past year. Because it's, it's actually with all the maple leaves coming out. And barred owls are really wonderful in the spring. Because they pretty much eat anything that they can get their claws onto. But in the springtime, they've got this really wonderful story of like their life and their ecology. And it ties into... And a lot of times, this is a painting by Barry, Barry Van Dusen. I'm not sure how well you can see but you can see a barred owl tucked up in a tree looking down. And it's just like that picture that I showed at the very beginning on. So just think of these owls sitting in the trees and looking down. Okay, that's a painting by an artist in Princeton. But these are wood frogs, which you'll have in the vernal pools here. If you ever hear quacking ducks and then you realize the pond is full of frogs, it's these. And this will be the first warm day, in basically where stuff starts to thaw in April or maybe even March. They actually fill, these wood frogs actually fill their body with uh, sugar. Their livers, their muscles, and their blood vessels, their blood with sugar because they can stay above the frost line because the sugar acts as an antifreeze and their cells won't freeze because they're full of sugar. Um, and then they, they actually come out, they emerge earlier. Yeah, so you can feel free to use that around Valentine's Day too. But they go into these vernal pools right here. And I actually have videos of the owls pulling them out. I just don't know how well you're going to see it. But this is where they're mating and laying eggs in the springtime with the wood frogs. And then a few days later, the other frogs will do this. But I took this, that, this picture this spring because they're going to be laying eggs in here. And then here's the other famous frog in the spring. That's a sp oh, and this is smaller than a quarter, just to give you a size. So that's, that's the, if you look, that's the leaf's, if you look at the leaf's, um, the stalk of the leaf, for lack of a better way to describe it, because the word's seeming, that, that it's foots on the stalk of the leaf. So you can get a sense of how tiny it is. I took this at like 9 o'clock at night uh, this April with my daughter. And, and so you can even see the blood vessels of in, inside the, the sack in the, in the spring peeper right there. Yeah, so they sound, like wood, they sound like wood ducks, but they're wood frogs, yeah. And um, what the owl is thinking there, as it's sitting up there and looking down, and sitting up in the trees like this, it's thinking lunch. Yeah, because they're all, they're, because they'll, they'll even pull fish out of, out of water too. They'll eat fish, they eat woodpeckers, they eat everything. 
And then I'll, I'll talk a little bit about migration now, too. And uh, please feel free to pipe in with any questions because I kind of want to tell you what's going to be going on right now and uh, with what you can see. But this is a painting done by Charlie Harper um, called Mystery of the Missing Migrants. Charlie Harper, and you've probably seen his work in various forms. It's a lot of simple shapes. Mm -hmm. So you get the whole pattern of the bird, but, you know, you don't see the feathers. You see the wings and stuff like this. So this was painted because as he, as he um, got older in Ohio, he loved watching bird migration, but he noticed a lot of his favorite migratory birds, especially like the wood thrush among other birds, they started to decline. So, you know, you can think of Silent Spring and stuff like this. So he painted this painting um, to draw attention to that. And we own, this is part of the, uh, the Museum of American Bird Arts collection. But there's also a really important biological story in here. And I'll talk about that at the end, but I just want to show it to you one more time that you may, you probably don't know about bird migration. So I want to kind of highlight this as we're moving along here. I'll just show you the painting one more time and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the, the clues in there at the very end too. But it's also hard to see on a little screen too, right there. Okay, so bird migration. So here is a yellow warbler. This is gonna be nesting in this area during the summer there as well. It does sweet, 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 or sweet. It's a beautiful bird. But what are the little facts about bird migration? So over the next month, there's probably gonna be two to four billion birds flying through the United States. Uh, tonight and tomorrow night, you're gonna be looking at 200 to 300 million birds flying through different parts of the country right through there. And this is a, this, we're not even near peak migration scene season. Almost all bird migration happens at night. So a little after dusk and a little before dawn, the birds take off and start to migrate. And then most will land before the uh, dawn of the next day, recharge, refuel, may take a couple of days, may not. Some will, you know, some could fly continuously up for 60 to 100 hours right now there as well too. Uh, but typically think dawn to dusk. And we're starting to learn a lot more about bird migration for with some technological tools and then also people like you recording when they're seeing birds and that getting submitted to Cornell, eBird and other things like that. There's a lot of citizen science that's important here. But here's one main reason we're starting to learn more about bird migration. This is meteorological radar right through here. I'm not gonna be able to play the video but I can share it of the, fl the birds flying over the Florida Keys because bird migration will show up in weather. If they didn't realize it, it's not raining, but it's red or yellow, like heavy rain, there's tens of thousands of birds flying over in that area. And then another thing that they're using here, and just so it's easy to see, this is Delaware Bay and it's a flyway between Delaware and New Jersey. And what they have set up there is they have acoustic recording speakers, acoustic recording devices there, and also thermal imaging cameras pointed straight up in the night sky because millions of birds fly over that flyway right through there. So they take those two things in there as well too. And what's really amazing here, these are all the warblers in Eastern North America. These warblers of the other birds, they have their own songs at night that's different from songs during the day. And you can see the sonograms that are right there. So they can record all the bird songs, adjust the frequency, and like basically adjust it right there, and estimate how many birds are flying above them, combine that with the thermal imaging camera, but then use computer programs and know what birds are actually flying over and what numbers. And having this data for years, they're able to make accurate bird forecasts. So this is last, this is last September, and I'm gonna show you tonight's forecast as well. But September 22nd through September 25th, they estimated 340, 360, and 280 million birds flying over those three nights. And you can see the light color right there. Okay. And I don't know which day it was, but actually they can do, they, then they can actually tell how many birds actually flew. I mean, not exactly to the number, but actually one of those nights it was 475 million birds flew instead of the 300 whatever when I looked that up. And so when you see, so the intensities, the brighter the colors there are uh, where the birds are flying through. So here's tonight's forecast. Tomorrow, so tonight they're estimating about 225 million, tomorrow 252 million, and then the 14th and 15th a little over 320 million. And you can see here, just to give you the idea. But they can also do it um, per state. So I'm gonna show you Massachusetts because I wanna show you the difference when, when storm fronts come through as well too because they're, they're basically trying to fly for free. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, and I'm going to show you the temperature forecast, too, for two nights. So here's tomorrow. Here's tonight. So tonight, they're estimating about 132,000 birds in Massachusetts. And you'll notice very little bit of the state is lit up. And then over Boston, a little less than 1,000, Worcester 500, Springfield 400. So you can see that map right there. OK? And no, no, I went to Holy Cross in Northeastern. Cornell's got the best uh, ornithological lab in the world, though. Yeah. But now, this is tomorrow night. So you're looking at almost a million birds tomorrow night flying through the state. And they can, but they can also take 20 years of data, combine that with meteorological data, and make accurate forecasts of when they're going to move based on what the upcoming weather forecast is as well, too. Yeah, yeah, you get a, so you can see all, but you can see the color there is orange, right? So birds can fly miles up, like you might, you know, thousands of feet to miles, and miles is too high, but you know what I mean, like higher up. But they can also fly just 100, 200, 300 feet off the ground. So this color right here um, represents of when skyscrapers and larger buildings should have their lights off at night. Because if you ever look, and I don't put these in there, but if you, if you type in chimney swifts in um, the NASCAR Hall of Fame, like one night in the fall or in the spring, you know, one to 2,000 chimney swifts all flew into the building and died because they hit the glass because the lights are on. So they, they, they're not flying, you know, that high above the ground during migration. So larger skyscrapers can hit. So this is part of, this is like lights out. So these are days where, you know, Last month, there's no birds really. There might be some migraine, but it's very low. So having the lights on in the Prudential or the Hancock or whatever is not a big deal. You turn them out tomorrow night, you may save hundreds of birds. Because you walk around the skyscrapers in the morning, there could be dozens of birds just at your feet mm -hmm. because they're flying into the glass. So if you look here, and since I can't show you on the screen, I'm just going to circle it. This is Brockton's forecast for the next couple of days. And what I'm going to circle is the, is the low temperature for tomorrow night. And you can see the, the front coming through is tomorrow, where the temperature drops down mm -hmm. right there. And that's where they're estimating the million or so birds coming through the state. Yeah. And I suspect it's because the, the air pressure is changing and there's going to be a front in currents. Mm -hmm. You know, if you actually notice birds flying into your windows, you can put up stickers. You know, you can find bird stickers. You can put anything up there. Where just basically, just think of, like, if you're walking in, if you're looking and you're a bird flying in and you see the reflection of the sky and the glass, you think you're flying into the sky and then you hit the window and you're dead. Or your 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 wound or something like that right through there. So that you know in houses can happen, um, you know. But on a skyscraper, you could take out again if there's five thousand birds flying through, and let's say one percent there. That's you know fifty to hundred birds flying through right there um, can happen there as well too. And that's independent of the birds that you see attacking your glass or attacking your side view mirrors or something like that. That's typically a territorial thing, and the bird thinks it's seeing a competitor. Yeah. Any other questions on that? And I'll be happy to answer more, too. So this is from May 14th, 2021. And this is when this, I think, was the night when 450 million birds went through, this, through the country right through here. So you can see right there, you know, so. Nobody wants to go to St. Louis. <laughs> no, I guess they're going around. Yeah. But this is when I, 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 was, I was updating the talk in the springtime because I was trying to do this in there. And then during that week, these are all the pictures I took from that week, right through here. So this is all of a sudden, this is when the catbird started coming back, right through here. Well, you're going to have lots of DW fields. Yeah. 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 And then here's a blue wing warbler that was right next to the catbird. And there's no way you're not going to have these blue wing warblers here in May. And it's also, like you see, it's also when they're migrating through and, you know, time of day. You know, here's another picture of it. And then this one is in a, that's a yellow-rumped warbler, which you'll see here. Have you seen those here? Yellow-rumped? Will these stay here? Or no, they're just moving through. The yellow warbler that I showed at the, about two weeks, yeah. But it might just be a day in those two weeks. The yellow-rumped, uh, the yellow warblers in the colon yellow throats, they're going to nest in DW fields. I'd be shocked if they weren't based on your habitat, just like the Orioles. But, but this is a yellow rump. This one won't nest here. But what you see here, what I really like with this, is this is, and it's in a weird teardrop position, 
this is what I want to tie in as we're finishing up, too. All these birds are going for insects. And it's going around the oak catkin right here. And I'll leave this up on the screen because you can kind of see it here. But this is a yellow rumped warbler. It's not the best picture, but if you look at it, I just lost my screen. Okay. It's moving into the oak catkin right there. And it picked out a caterpillar right there. It's in its beak. Okay. Yep. And then, as you look here, here's a better picture of the yellow rumped warbler right there. These will come back earlier, and in the fall, these are actually going to, if you're, if there's lots of poison ivy around here, and you see a lot of birds, their digestive system changes and lengthens in the fall, because they're one of the last ones to go back. So they can actually digest waxy fruit, and other birds can't. So they'll actually eat your poison ivy berries and then other fruits as well there too, whereas other warblers don't. But their actually digestive system changes, and the enzymes they produce change. And so they're spreading it around. Yeah, but I could have 50 to 100 of them through there. And then what I want to kind of show you here as well is I want to go back to that Nashville warbler. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to show these pictures close because this kind of gets at, you're going to have dozens of caterpillars in this picture as well too. But this Nashville warbler, again, only here for a couple of days. But see how it speaks right in the flower right there? This is called gleaning. Basically, they're manipulating the flower. And I've got four or five pictures. But it's using its beak like a pair of tweezers to open and close the flower. So I'm going to go to the next picture. Okay. And see how it's using it like a pair of pliers or tweezers to open the flower up. And so that's why, like, again, like, you don't, these, these trees are really important, especially when you're not spraying them, because they, this is where all the food sources are for these birds. And this just happened to be outside my office window oh, wow. oh. over in Canton. But these will be all over the place. It's also just kind of like knowing what to look for and being patient. Mm -hmm. So when the cherry flowers or crab apple flowers are in bloom, I'll go out five, six times a day for a couple of minutes to see if there's any birds in there because the pictures come out really nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can see there it's just opening and closing the flowers. And so it goes through all these flowers right through there. Because I'm going to close off talking, yeah, to try and find the bugs. I'm going to talk about the chickadees because it's an incredible amount of insects that these birds need to, one, survive on their own, but also make it through um, to successfully raise their, their fledglings. And so I want to kind of close here with just thinking about chickadees because everybody has chickadees and going around here. This is a chickadee nest with five chickadees in it. You can actually see the moss and the ferns in there. And I just want you to think as we're talking about this, is how many insects, caterpillars or other insects, that the two parents have to collect over the three, four weeks that they're in their box. Okay, and then multiply that by all the birds that you see. So how many wow. caterpillars is, do they have to collect overall? And believe it or not, there's research done that actually had graduate students going out and counting the, the birds going to and from their boxes here. So think about that. So um, I want you to think of this and think of the fields here. So this is a chickadee, and they actually act like woodpeckers here. That's a chickadee excavating a, 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 a decaying birch tree on the side of a, a, a stream at Whedon Farm in Easton, right through there. And I'll just show these pictures on the screen right here, because I'm just going to go through the whole process of it, excavating it. So here's the empty nest right here, and then the chickadee bringing out the wood chips, shaking its head, shaking its head, and flying away right through there. And then here's a picture of a fledged chickadee coming out of the box at the museum there as well. But chickadees, and think of this with other birds as well too, are going to need anywhere between like six and 10,000 caterpillars over those five weeks, four weeks, to survive. So the parents have to go out and collect th four or 5,000 caterpillars each, or however the labor is divided right there, to successfully raise a single clutch. If they're down to two to, th to 5,000, one bird might make it, or none. If they're like, you know, three to 6,000, might be two instead of the five. So like the food sources, and they need insect protein. So feeders are useful in the fall, uh, like in the winter time. But almost all the birds that you see, 95 to 96%, other than goldfinches, I can't think of one off the top of my head, they, they have to raise their babies off of protein that they're going to get from 
insects or spiders or what, what, what not right there. And so caterpillars are one of the most essential food sources. So I don't know if that's a, yeah. I don't know if that's a, a native oak or not. I'm assuming that it is. That oak tree right there can have between four to 450 native species of caterpillars eating on it. A uh, nori maple, which I heard you talking about earlier, maybe 40, okay? Um, I'm gonna, we'll, we'll assume one of these trees is a native dogwood. I think 275 species of, um, of, caterpill of caterpillars, uh, native blueberry, like high bush blueberry in the, you know, over 200. A kozu dogwood, which you see a lot there as well, zero, or maybe one species of caterpillar right there. Yeah, so I just wanted to highlight the importance of, um, of like native plants to, to this as well too. And, uh, you know, so with that, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. And, and thank you so much for inviting me, and this was a very nice afternoon. Yeah.